I'm so thrilled to be talking with you. Likewise. I just remember a very brief moment we had on television for like two seconds. I remember what you made. Do you really? Yes. It was in Brodo, mm -hmm. stuffed with a beautiful soft cheese. It was like the most delicate dish. Wow. I think I'd ever tasted. And Padma was like, Kristen's dish is unbelievable. <laughs> Do you remember it all? I mean, it must have taken a shit ton of work. I do. It was a homemade capoletti pasta filled with delice Borgogna cheese, apricots, a rich chicken brodo fortified with lots of butter and some kind of fortified wine, and then something here and there. And we were cooking outside. And I remember the whole gardens and everything. I remember every dish I tasted. And I love to cook. I'm not great. And I love food, especially Italian food. Mm. And naively, I think one of the surprising things actually about guesting on Top Chef right. was just how incredible every dish was. The producers wanted me to be critical. Yeah. I had no <laughs> idea what to critique. I mean, at that point, I think there were still like 10 or 12 chefs. Yeah. How did you feel when they would bring in people like me? who are not chefs and really have no idea what we're talking about. <laughs> Already, I was a person that was inexperienced on television. Being the center of attention felt very awkward for me. It still does. And so already I'm in this flight or fight kind of happening. And so when you throw in people that you've only seen on television or in a movie that are so far removed from your personal life, and you're already looking at them being like, wow, how do they do that? Because I'm someone with social anxiety, large groups of people freak me out, all the things. And how can this person we see on television do such an amazing job and become this person that whether truly embodies or is really good at just showcasing their confidence? And so it's that dynamic. It's not saying, oh, there's that movie star. It's about who they are, what they do, how they project that then freaks me out because those are personality traits that I highly admire, right? And I wish I possessed myself. And so that's where the dynamic for me started to kind of play with my head. And you'd get far more into your head and you just want to impress. And I don't know, it's terrifying. In one word, it's terrifying. So it kind of comes around full circle because you seemed super confident and I felt really nervous and out of place. Well, thank you. <laughs> Fake it till you make it. No. So I'm someone that has always had social anxiety and major issues with feeling like I'm being judged, largely in part because I always judge myself so harshly. And so you're thrust on television. You go through this process where you are mainly there to be judged and to showcase how great you are. And already, like, I mean, it's so hard to say I'm the best and I'm going to win. And so ultimately what happened when I came out of that, I was just trying to make it one day at a time, just one more day, one more day, let's see what happens. And so ultimately when it was all said and done and I came out victorious, what that show taught me was after it all played out and people are watching it, that people viewed me in such a different way that I viewed myself. Really? Oh yeah. Again, like I felt so self-conscious and so unworthy of being there in a lot of ways. That when people watched and I got that positive validation of saying, wow, you, you know, you look so sure and you have a strong sense of self and da, 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 all this stuff. I'm like, wow, maybe I'm not as bad as I actually think that I am in my own head. And so that was the marking of a personal movement and change in me that I was like, oh, OK, now people aren't lying. Like my mom's not being like, yeah, you're amazing. And me not believing it. It's now strangers that have just watched this whole thing unfold that are saying it. And you have to believe it at that point. You know, I didn't have awards and I didn't have James Beard nominations like a lot of the other chefs. I just, I was working in a 10 seat kitchen nearly by myself. There were only three other people and we just did nightly dinners. And little did I know that was the most important quality that I could have had going into a setting like that. It reminds me a little bit of my experience filming the first scary movie. It was my first big role ever. And I thought for sure I was going to get fired. And I also was delusional during the making of it. I thought, oh, this is a funny movie, but it's also a scary mm. movie. Like I had no concept of the larger picture because I kind of thought my performance was really muted and kind of dumb and one dimensional. And when it came out and people were complimentary, it did reframe my confidence around it. Yeah. I mean, we're so far in our heads. 
you know, and I think that people tend to have empathetic tendencies or are true empaths and people that truly are trying to grow into a better human being are so far in their heads because you're just trying to be something and to continue growing, to do all these things. And at a certain point, you're like, step out for air and realize what am I trying to fix? What am I trying to fix that I shouldn't be trying to fix? And holy shit, I am actually just fine. More than fine in a lot of cases. Was it after the show came out that you started to embrace that idea? Because I remember you as unbelievably statuesque, stunning, and contained. And it's an interesting journey, I think, when one doesn't sort of see themselves until the broader audience sees them. You know, a lot of it comes down to purpose. And I feel like without a strong sense of purpose, I have a hard time seeing all those things. So on Top Chef, I know my purpose. I'm there. I'm competing. I'm a chef trying to vie for this title. But the larger purpose on a very much personal life, I wasn't tapped into and I didn't actually have a connection to come back to. The purpose perhaps could have been, which looking back on it now, was, you know what? Listen, Kristen, we're just going to step out there and we're actually going to believe what I'm saying out loud, which was, it's time for something new and actually believe those words because then I would have a purpose to drive me forward, not just winning, not just the show, not just something that is ultimately temporary in a season of a television show and ultimately withstanding the test of time and aiming for the longevity of personal growth. And had I had that insight perhaps back then, I could have looked at it a little differently. But, you know, these things that we possess, whether, you know, self-conscious and anxious and da 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 all these things, and people are always telling us to fix it, to make them go away, to put them into a different corner of your life. You got to get it out of your space. When in reality, I really started to embrace it when I said, you know what, I'm going to embrace those things. I'm going to figure out how to take these nuances of who I am, coexist with them, and flip them into something that feels more helpful to me and my journey. And so it doesn't happen overnight. It certainly is like a constant reminder daily. I mean, Top Chef was 2014, and I'm still constantly working on those things. But I'm more aware of it now, of my positive qualities, because I think I'm more in tune and aware and accepting of the things that I thought I was supposed to not be. I think we all have this stereotype a little bit from a distant perspective of the temperamental but brilliant chef. What qualities does it take to be a leader in the kitchen? And what are your strengths in that? Yeah, you know, we're taught, especially as a chef, you have to be strong and you have to work harder and you have to work better than anyone else. And you have to create food that no one's ever seen before. And you've got to have awards, all this materialistic garbage that ultimately does not matter. And that's why I stepped away from traditional restaurants for years before I decided to open up my own. And what I learned opening up my own was the moments of magic happen in between all the cooking that happen in between the day to day of the stress. You know, we all have a job to do. We have to get food out. We have to do it nicely and perfectly as we can because a guest is paying money for it. And so, yes, we have to deliver on all these bullet points. But where it comes down to character development and where it comes down to personal growth for someone else. And as a good leader, I believe my strongest quality, hopefully, and I hope my team would say the same thing, is that talking about and listening to how people learn, how they accept information, right? Because what I say to you, someone else isn't going to find that as helpful, or maybe they find it slightly offensive. We all learn different ways. And so when I started to figure out each person in my kitchen, again, if they're willing to accept and kind of meet you halfway, is trying to figure out how you learn, but I'm going to learn that by being observant, not telling you what to do, but asking you how you'd like to do it. So the whole rule in the kitchen is like, there's only one answer and it's yes, chef. I don't agree. It's a conversation. It's a moving machine that involves a lot of different pieces and those pieces are the people. And so it's a lot of asking questions. One of my favorite things is teaching some of the new guys that come in front of the house, particularly not to call them out, is to teach someone They show up with this like balled up apron. And I'm like, you guys, you can't go out there like that. Like, come on. It looks sloppy. You just rolled out of bed. And so I take them into the service station over in in in-room dining. And I'm going to say, have you ever ironed before? No, chef. Okay, no problem. That's fine. We have an iron. Let's fill it up with water. We're going to show you the steam is really going to help get out those linen kinks. And it's going to be great. So we iron and they put it on. And whether they're bullshitting me or not, I don't really care because it's ultimately a really great moment. They put it on. And I'm like, tie it. And there's a physical, like your shoulders go back. You stand up a little straighter. I'm like, how do you feel 
Now, yes, it's about making you presentable, and this is part of your job to have an ironed pressed uniform. But more importantly, how does it make you feel? And when you can tap into making someone feel better, I feel like that's the greater story of it all. How do you think if you went to your 20-year high school reunion, how would people describe you? You grew up in Michigan, is that right? Yes. You were born in South Korea? Yeah, I was born in Seoul, Korea. At four months, I was adopted, flew to Michigan, met my family, and grew up till I was 18 and lived in Michigan. And so, you know, it was classic suburbia, I thought. Midwest, suburban. My high school was incredibly diverse. Not diverse just even in race, but points of views. Just everything that like a lot of schools sometimes don't have because they're so centralized in certain communities. But anyways, that was huge because it also allowed people like me not to be an outsider. And they are like, one, I can't believe you didn't tell us you were gay. I was like, it has nothing to do with you. Relax. <laughs> Let's step down for a second and recognize that me not telling you is nothing about you. Secondly, I think they would say that all my teachers always said that I was nice. And that's kind of all that really matters to me. Totally. And, you know, and I think a lot of it was because I was quiet. I just kind of kept to myself. I wasn't boy hungry, obviously. So I kind of just like did my thing. And I like to work hard and do well and hopefully be nice to other people. <laughs> How old were you when you first thought that you were in love or felt in love or were in love? Okay, well, I knew I can pinpoint the exact moment. We were in high school and I can't remember what year it was. 90s. Notting Hill came out. Remember that movie with Julia Roberts and Hugh Grant? Of course. Oh, classic. Yes. Great movie. And I was in the theater and I walked out of the theater and I was like, I love her. Damn, damn. <laughs> I'm in love with this character. Anna Scott. That was her name. You're right. You are so good. Yes. And I was like, oh, God. Oh, God. Here we are. Oh, crap. I couldn't speak of the words for a very long time. And that was a personal insecurity, not anything that I was taught not to do or to be. But I knew it. I knew it right then and there. I always kind of knew it. And then I really knew it when I could associate a person. I think we're not dissimilar in the sense of like a craving of intimacy. I felt there were times where I was really in love with a friend, mm. like just melting together in a way that made me feel so excited that I was connecting with somebody. Right. Did you have a close friendship like that as well? I never had a crushes on my friends. And I think I can tell you why. Looking at my future patterns of what I find attractive and what I genuinely find the most compelling about another human being is there's this sense of power. And I don't mean power in money. I don't mean power in what your job is. It's a power and sense of self. It's like this aura, right? That's just like so strong. And you got your shit. To Anna Scott, Notting Hill, fucking power, right? But also very vulnerable with herself. But none of my high school friends, please. Like, none of us were in a space to be that kind of person, myself included. So, no, I never really had that kind of moment where I'm like, oh, my God, I think I'm in love with my friend. Yeah. Will you tell us a little bit about your wedding and congratulations? Thank you. My husband and I got married during quarantine as well. We just eloped, though. Yeah, congrats. Thank you. What month did you get married? June 2021. We had both been married before. Yeah. We were like, how do we do this so we enjoy it? the most. Mm -hmm. And you just do it for you. And that's the move right there. And that's kind of what we did. So Bianca, she's Australian. So her family's all in Australia. Her and I had been engaged and kind of we had, this is all before lockdown, like her career's going wherever it's going, my career's going wherever it's going. And like, it never became this priority of like, let's sit down and actually plan a wedding. Maybe it's a subconscious feeling of like, we didn't want to have to do all that work. It just sounds exhausting to me personally. Totally. And you're already in the hospitality business. Right, right. Right. I'm OK without the whole fanfare of a traditional wedding. And, you know, we decided we were living in Manhattan and we built a home in Connecticut and we are spending the majority of our time here because it's beautiful. And we had this great new house. We're kind of making it our own. We're still kind of picking out different light fixtures and different things like that. But it just started to feel everything was settled. And the chaos of what was going on in our brains, being our professional life, married with living in New York, married with just like that go, go, go mentality, was removed. And so now we're just sitting here. And we realized that we weren't going to be able to go to Australia. We weren't going to get them to come here because this is when like no one was flying like that. And we we're like, well, if that's not going to happen anytime soon, let's just do it for us. Right. And so the morning of our wedding, oh, my God, it's so homemade back patio. We went to Marshall's and found like these bookshelves. Right. 
And I was like, we need some kind of backdrop because like that dead tree is not going to look cute. And so (laughs) we, I say we, meaning my wife, really took these bookshelves and we took a white sheet, nailed it into the back. So it was a white backdrop. And then these bookshelves of natural wood with like picture frames and flowers and all the stuff of our family. We had our justice of the peace who was absolutely brilliant And then our family on Zoom watching the whole thing. And we wrote our own vows. How rad. Yeah. And we stood in our backyard and we did it. And then afterwards, I made tacos and we drank champagne. (laughs) That just sounds perfect. How did you meet Bianca? And, And would you consider yourself a romantic? Oh, yeah. How you were just describing you. I was like, and yes, you know, in all the great ways and beautiful ways of being able to fall in love and being in love with falling in love and all of it to the ways where sometimes you overlook your own sense of self and you overlook what you want because you're aiming for love. So I've had three serious relationships in my life and all at really important times of my life. And none of them I would change. Both of them prior to Bianca are all relationships that I deeply cared for the other person and I truly loved circumstantially, maturity level, you know, my willingness to get vulnerable with myself, communication, like all those things are the breakdowns of the relationships. But that doesn't mean that those relationships weren't as great, right, in those moments as I thought in my head. There was something about Bianca and that relationship happened differently. We met because when I was opening my restaurant. The one in Boston or in Austin? Austin. The restaurant in Austin is called Arlo Gray. And I opened it at the Line Hotel, which is right downtown on Lady Bird Lake. And When I opened, she was the corporate food and beverage director tasked with opening all their new hotels. Sidel Group had like a portfolio of many, many hotels. And so she's like bouncing from city to city, opening restaurants, doing her thing and, you know, making sure things actually open on time. And we met because we had to work together. You know, it was a slow falling in love, which I feel like I necessarily didn't have in the past two. Like I was like all in gung ho and I was like, I'm going to make this work and this is going to be it. For her, and I think because of those past two relationships, I was slightly more patient and I was patient with myself. And in those working moments were where I learned a lot about her, but I also was learning a lot more about myself. And I needed that. And I needed that patience. And I needed someone to understand that as well. And also to be on that same kind of journey together. And that was her. She is the most kind, empathetic, caring, loving, talented, smart, genuinely just like soulfully beautiful person I've ever met. I love it that when our listeners can't see you, but I do love that (laughs) you start to smile when you speak about Bianca. And my ulterior motive, I'm so thrilled to have you on the podcast because I really want to insert myself into your lives. (laughs) So hopefully you'll (laughs) like me enough by the end of this. We have a room ready for you. You are oh my welcome God. to Connecticut anytime. Kristen, don't say that. <laughs> You'll regret it. You should check with Bianca first. We can cook together. It'll be magical. Everything will be magical. Your husband as well. <laughs> Thank you. He was just giving me like the what? What? I'm not included? <laughs> Kristen, will you tell us a little bit about Fast Foodies and what has been the most difficult item to recreate? And can I go on it sometimes? Yeah, oh my, I don't even know why you weren't even on this season. <laughs> Someone needs to make note. Elena, make note. No, so this whole show came to be in the middle of complete lockdown. It was like when the world actually just shut down in the beginning of March of 2020. So conversations are rolling and things are happening. And at first I'm like, okay, this sounds great. You go, we eat some fast food. Let's talk about it. Let's remake it. Let's cook. Let's have a good time. Fantastic. And then we start filming and the beauty of this show, and it's only really developed, especially coming into the second season, because Justin, Jeremy and myself are all far more comfortable with one another and with the primary concept of the show. And ultimately, we have a celebrity guest come on. They bring us any fast food of their liking. We do our damnedest to copycat it exactly. Like if the fries are dry, flares are going to be dry. If they're under seasoned, we're going to under season. We're like nailing it. I'm a rule follower. And like those are like moments where I'm like one more grain of salt is going to be too perfect. And so then you go through the series of like having fun and they judge and the winner gets a advantage going into the next round. And that next round is ultimately where we take the essence of their item. I don't know, do some crazy chef things to it, rework it into something in our own style that is inspired by. And so this is huge because I feel like a lot of my dishes anyways in my restaurant are inspired off of like less than desirable or less fancy food. And you try to make them nicer and you tap into nostalgia. And so that's basically it. It's two rounds of cooking, copycat, remix, 
fun, drinking if you choose, and conversation. And I get to hang out with two of my dear friends and cook after hours. Like there's nothing not to love. And the whole thing about it is as uncomplicated as it is in concept and in theory, the conversations, the things that happen on camera and off camera with our guests and getting to know other people, again, someone like you, right? We're going to roll. We're going to have these moments. But sometimes when the camera shuts off, like conversations open up, they get slightly more vulnerable. You get to know someone on a different level. And those are the fun moments for me where you get to meet really cool people and understand who they are and why they are so great at what they do. I love that. What a fucking rad job. And we get to eat. We eat a lot. And we get to eat each other's food. We get to have that competitive edge, but no one actually goes home and no one actually wins anything of value. (laughs) (laughs) Just, you know, friendship. Yeah. (laughs) Kristen, do you mind if we get to callers? Yeah, let's do it. I'm all about it. Yeah. Okay. You'll see me at sort of my most qualified and least qualified at the same time. Hey, Madison. Hi, Anna. Hi. You're here with Kristen Kish. She Hi. is fucking Hi, rad. Kristen. <laughs> Hi, how are you? Nice to meet you. <laughs> it's nice to meet you both. Thank you. How are you guys? Great. We're great. Thank you so much for writing in. Will you tell us what's going on? Sure. So it's been kind of like an ongoing argument with my mother. Um, it doesn't really matter what the argument is about. It just kind of always ends up in the same place. And so my mom, she's very passionate. She's very excitable, emotional, loud, loud. And I am more sensitive and quiet, very introverted. So part of just being more comfortable myself had to do with like a lot of like setting up boundaries and not in a way to upset my mother, but just to like keep myself more balanced. And since I've started doing those things, I've noticed that really every area of my life has improved. Like just things like start falling into place more naturally since I've been able to take care of myself better. I got a job and I moved away, so I don't get to spend as much time with family, which, you know, can suck, but I I feel better, I guess. So you're geographically distanced from your mom? Well, not even that far. So I live in Los Angeles and they live in Ventura County, but I've just always been very (laughs) close with them. You have a high maintenance mom in Los Angeles? (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Crazy, right? (laughs) So there's been a lot of times where she's very excited when she's talking and she's basically like yelling at me. And I tell her like, please don't talk to me like that. I try to be nice. I try to respond rather than react because I know just I could set her off like that. And I guess our most recent argument, it just, it was probably like a couple of weeks ago and she wasn't getting the answer for me that she wanted. My voice raised a little bit and it all of a sudden it turned into drop your attitude with me. Why are you calling me a bad mother? It just like really escalates, like making me feel guilty for trying to set boundaries with her. Madison, would you feel comfortable telling us like the context of the argument? Yeah. So it was over the weekend. My mom calls me. I was supposed to go over, but I was waiting on my sister's COVID test and she didn't know that I was waiting on her test. So she just like basically kept asking over and over again, like, well, why? Like, I thought she already got her results. And I told her, like, no, I'm still waiting. I work with kids, so I try to be cautious. So she's like being obstinate. Like, she already knows the information. Yeah. Yet she's still pressing you. <laughs> yeah. And meanwhile, she's driving in Los Angeles and she's yelling at other drivers on the phone. So it's just like a very hectic phone call. So I tell her, like, okay, please stop yelling at me. That's when she tells me to drop my attitude. And she didn't call me to have an argument with me. I'm like, well, I didn't, like, I was having a nice weekend. Can I ask you a question? Sure. So outside of the more chaotic conversations mm-hmm. that you and your mother have, what's the other side of that? Where do you find that you're actually having, if there is any, a conversation that feels like you're being met and she's also being met? Well, I guess our relationship is like pretty good. Otherwise, when we start to butt heads about like how I'm kind of like a sensitive person and I guess I, guess I kind of start to withdraw a little bit and then she gets offended, basically. Mm. I have a tough time with people who are easily offended. <laughs> Isn't that terrible? 
Because sometimes it feels like a choice, you know? Yeah. How do your sisters feel? And are your parents still married? My parents aren't still married. It was a long, messy separation and then divorce. When was that? I knew my parents were going to get divorced when I was in second grade. My parents finally separated when I was in about 10th grade. That was 2010. And I think the divorce was final in like 2019. Oh, God. Yes. Mm, what a long So divorce. long. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that must have been so hard for you and your sisters, Madison. Yeah. Like yeah. just hearing both sides and like, oh. But how do your sisters sort of react to your mom? And are you guys in alignment? Yeah, my sisters and I were definitely a united front. I'm very close with them. I would say, you know, they're my best friends. I grew up raising them and I was very protective of them. So you're the oldest? Yes. Yes, I'm the oldest. Okay. Oh, gosh. All right. <laughs> Extra burden. Yeah. So I guess when I left, I just don't have the same tolerance for the chaos anymore. Like, I used to be able to put up with it and I'd be able to, like, fight with my words just as well. But now I'm just like, oh, no, thank you. But, like, as soon as I get home, sometimes I notice it kind of, like, slips in a little bit. Like, I revert back to my <laughs> old self. How frequently do you talk with your mom and how frequently do you see her? I probably talk to my mom once or twice a week and I see her now maybe like twice a month. What's the guilt level that she puts on that arrangement? Not too much, but when she does see me, I feel like she's almost trying to make up for something and I don't know how to explain it. Mm. She doesn't put as much effort into seeing me as I put into her. So I feel like I need to be there a lot of the times. You know what sounds really interesting? And how old are you again? I'm 26. And so I say this not out of telling you more. I feel like I've also kind of gone through and seen both sides of both your mom and you, both in, my, <laughs> in myself, multiple personalities, apparently. But I, when I was the most insecure in myself and when I felt the most unworthy of love and appreciation, when I felt like things were out of my control, I spoke like your mother, right? I was fighting to fight. I was meeting it with resistance. Anytime someone called me out, I called them out harder. And it was just like this constant berating. But ultimately, what it comes down to is an insecurity within your mother. And perhaps it's the divorce. It's perhaps her kids having these conversations with her. And when we hit a certain age, Madison, our parents will always be our mom and our dad. But at a certain point, we start seeing them, and I'm hitting that age right now, and I wish I hit it earlier, we start seeing them as people. And they have come with a built-in narrative. They have come in with story before you came along. And so when you came along, it was mom mode. It was everything I am, I'm going to just set aside, and I need to be a mother to my children. And then when your children start to kind of go off and do their own thing and find their own personalities, mom all of a sudden settles back into who she was before you came along. Right. Because subconsciously, you connect the majority of your actions with your subconscious. And that's a fact. And there's a lot that she's holding on from her past. And so maybe, I don't know, take it or leave it. When presenting your mom with these moments, not doing it in the heat of an actual example and more of asking, inquiring questions of who she is and what feels hurtful to her and asking her to explain where she's coming from about her feelings. Because sometimes the more emotional, the more sensitive, the quieter one is able to receive that information more so than the other person. So you being the bigger person and saying, are you sad? Like, it sounds like it's derived from sadness. And loneliness? Yeah. Do you think, Madison? I definitely would have said that at one point, but now, honestly, she's thriving in her life. You know, like the divorce was really hard for her and she had a few years where she was really depressed, but she actually went back to school. She has a new job. She has a wonderful boyfriend who she's been with for a few years. So Shit. <laughs> yeah. why is she giving you kind of <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, like she honestly, she's living the life that I've wanted her to have for a while. Mm. And I have mm. tried to, uh, so something she has said to me is when we have these arguments, it feels like I am bringing up 20 years worth of anger with her. So I thought I've forgiven her. You know, I try every single day. Like, yeah, I know she had a life for me. And I know that she had a completely different experience throughout the divorce and the marriage and raising us. So, you know, I tried to receive it with empathy. But I guess there is some resentment in my voice. And I think she hears that. Do you blame your mom for the divorce? 
when you were in second grade, did you sort of view her as? Mm, I guess while it was happening, I was really upset with my father, but I know I've been able to like fully forgive whatever unfairness I thought that I had, you know, experienced. So I think I have a good relationship with my dad. With my mom, though, I've definitely carried it for longer. I don't know if I blame her, but there's just so many things that I would have done differently, you know. What qualities in her do you not respect? And what qualities do you respect? I respect that she's very loving and she's very kind. And she always wants to show people like the best side of her. The side that I have a really hard time respecting is just the avoidance and not being able to take responsibility. And basically how the conversation ended was I asked her for an apology and she said that I was telling her to apologize with conditions, which I shouldn't have to ask of her because her apology was, I'm sorry you thought I was yelling. It wasn't my intention. And my whole point was, there's a big difference between I'm sorry for yelling and I'm sorry you thought I was yelling. And she didn't like that. How did it even escalate, though? Can we go back? Sorry, Madison. Yeah. I just like skipped over a bunch of stuff. I went straight to your childhood. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so how did the COVID test thing escalate? She ended up hanging up the phone. I sent her a text saying I didn't like how that conversation ended. And I, I apologized for like kind of snapping at her and maybe reacting badly And she said that I was placing all the blame on her. And it just, it felt very large when it didn't need to be. Yeah, it doesn't even feel like there was a grievance taking place. Mm -hmm. Like, do you think that's true, Madison? And does she frequently get sort of flustered by things that feel illogical? Yeah, yeah. I think she's afraid of being judged. And she sees that, you know, maybe my sisters and I have definitely been hard on her. Maybe she feels that. Mm. How have you guys been hard? The divorce was really messy and it was really hard on her. And I had to step up in a lot of ways from a very young age. And I held a lot of resentment and it really felt like a burden on me. She put a lot of the emotional, like she didn't have a therapist. She had her 17 year old daughter. So it was just a lot to deal with for a while. And she's apologized for really crying to me for all those years, but I'm not allowed to talk about it. You were the sponge at a time when you're already 17. It's like the worst. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it definitely sucks. You said something really interesting, and I was reading the letter, and it's very much the dynamic that your mother gives to you. But what was really important, and I feel like Anna was saying, incredibly important and very mature of you is to say, you know what, I think I've been carrying some of that resentment too. And energy is real, right? And so I feel like you can have your boundaries, but when you've made those boundaries with your mother, you have to take advantage of having those boundaries, first of all, where you're like, okay, take a little deep breath. And, you know, we all hear the thing, let's work on ourselves, let's dig in. But you've said something that literally is, I need to kind of look within a little bit because energy is real and moms are like the superheroes at picking up energy. And so perhaps when you do sometimes say something, it does come with resentment. However, now in your brain and how you're saying it, it doesn't sound like that at all. But for her, and again, we all hear different things differently. When you're able to kind of step back and reflect on what am I carrying and what is my piece of this puzzle and what does my road look like before I kind of step over and try to tell my mom this is not what I like about what she's doing to me. I feel like there's a little bit of that growth and there's room there. It's not that both parties have done all this work and now they're coming together and it's still not working. I think that there's work to be done on your individual selves and whether your mom does that or not to be seen. However, you are so aware of who you are, which is a really beautiful quality to have. Thank you. Kristen, if you were to assign us both to finally dice an onion, Mm. and I were to say, Kristen, you know that onions make me cry, and I don't know quite why you want me to chop the onion. Why can't Madison chop too? (laughs) 
I would say... <laughs> You're fired? <laughs> no, both of you are going to chop the onion. We're going to find the best avenue and the best box in which to chop the onion that makes you feel the best. Now, is that giving you onion goggles and putting you in a corner by yourself so you can cry in peace and you have onion goggles, you do your thing. And Madison's like, you know what? I just need a sharp knife. Let me to it and leave me alone. And I'd be like, I'm going to leave you alone and I'll go focus my energy where I need to. Very, very differently. How do you learn, Madison? Are you one that likes demand of directive or do you like someone to just give you a little bit and then walk away? I like when people give me a little bit and walk away. Yeah. I definitely get nervous when I feel the the heat, like the pressure from other people. So when I'm more comfortable, I think I'm able to learn better. Right. And you know, what's interesting is that sometimes my natural go-to, if you were in my kitchen and I was teaching you something, my natural go-to is giving you time because in my brain, time equals love. Time equals I'm giving you something, right? Mm -hmm. And that makes me feel worthy of needing to give you something. So when you say that, I know to back away. But if we never talked about that, we would be butting heads, right? You'd be like, why is she micromanaging me? I'd be like, why isn't she accepting my love? And I think that's what's happening with you and your mom. Yes. Yeah. I definitely see that. We have definitely like different love languages and I try to accept what she's giving, but sometimes I guess I'm not always as receptive. I feel like a degree of envy and confusion towards, like I have two friends who talk with their moms every day. I don't have that kind of relationship with my mom. I love her. We're close, but we're very different. We know each other well, so we can now anticipate reactions. Do you guys have that feeling of like, I don't know if it's a social obligation or if it's like, well, what's missing? We maybe face a little more societal pressure to be super tight with our moms. Mm. And Madison, is that what you want? I would like to be close with my mom. I do feel like there is something missing, you know, as much as, you know, we come together and we're happy in those moments. I do feel like a little something is missing, maybe something that I used to have with her. I'm not even really sure. Maybe it's just because I feel like I can't always be myself when I'm around her or talk about the things I need. And I don't know how to get it back either. Right. You know, it's interesting. I have a funny suspicion that your mom would say the exact same thing. Yeah, I bet you're right. You kind of both have the same desire, but your reactions are being triggered in very different ways. Yeah. But you both ultimately want the same thing. And I think oftentimes coming together and focusing on that same thing, perhaps, instead of this extra BS around us, right, that we're surrounded by every day, is sometimes a conversation and resetting can be as simple as, I need you in my life. I love you, I want to hear you, and I'm doing my best. Let that kind of sit and be really, really gentle while having your boundaries and saying, and that 20 minutes was enough for me right now, and I'm going to walk away. It's about the quality of what's happening, even in some short amount of times with those boundaries in place. Madison, in your letter, if you don't mind me quoting it, you write, in my family, I grew up as the overly emotional child. But that is particularly, it invalidates Uh, Yeah, it makes me tear up, honestly, just thinking about it. It invalidates your empathy to a degree. I think she is probably the kind of person who, like most of us, but maybe more than others, wants a lot of compliments. So it may be an easier road if you coat it with sugar a little bit. If you're like, Mom, I remember when you helped me finish that project, and even though we were late for school... Or I remember that Christmas when you did that special thing for me or that one time. And, you know, those are really wonderful memories for me. And I just want to thank you. And I love you. And then if you pad it with that, and it truly is all about timing, because I think a conversation is needed. You can tell her, you know, mom, that we react to things differently, you know, and I absorb things in a more sensitive way, and I try to look at all the angles. I want you to know how much I love you. Sometimes, though, it hurts my feelings, and I'm left kind of wondering why when you get a little upset with me or with my sisters over things that we don't have control over. And I called this actress and a chef. (laughs) (laughs) What do you think, Kristen? You know, I kind of come from the camp of anyone has the capabilities and the access to change your inner being. Now, whether you choose to do it or not, now that's a whole nother question. 
I think that as it stands, if you're like, mom, this is what you need to work on. We're going to change right now. No effing way. It's not going to happen. However, I think that like it was kind of already sort of being said, if you pad it with care and you pad it with love and you come at it from a genuine without resentment in your energy space, right? Not just in your voice, but in your truly energy space where you believe that, that oftentimes all it takes is that one person, sometimes your daughter, that one person to just flip something because the thing about moms, I'm not a mom, but I have one, is I can hear when my mom glows and she feels proud when I dig up something from way back when that she did that makes me really happy. And it is one of the greatest joys that I could ever have because all of a sudden I just gave her something that gave her a physical feeling and emotion response back, which ultimately then brings you and her together. So it's not you just like throwing BS at her to try to get her to listen. It's you actually pulling and you going deep enough into your past to say, that makes me feel so loved and cared for. And I'm going to share it with her now. So it doesn't even have to be a time or a place. You write it all down literally anytime you feel that. And I think it will also shift your perspective as well on how you view her, especially in those heated, volatile moments sometimes. That's a great idea. I think she would love that. One of her greatest prides in life is really raising my sisters and I. So I think she would love to like know that I really appreciate all those things. Mm -hmm. Being a mom is a thankless job. It is. I know. For many, (laughs) for many years. (laughs) For how many years? (laughs) (laughs) You know, and although she has all these other things happening, this great new job and this boyfriend and this and this and this, none of those people are saying thank you for being a great mom. That's a really great point. Madison, when I was probably a little bit younger than you are, I was your mom. I was combative. I was everything. And I just like threw it all at her. And I just, I didn't want to be. And I don't think your mom wants to be. I just don't know if she has any other outlet. Sometimes it's often driven by sadness, right? Or fear of not feeling like she's a good mother or fear that she's losing grasp of what she was for so long, you know, things like that. And those emotions are really powerful in making someone behave a certain way. So her behavior is not excused. In order for your self-reservation, her behavior is stemming from a place of like a real human feeling. You got to definitely got to keep that in mind as well. And eventually, yes, you can ask the same of her for sure. I think that if you start to shift your point of view, hers has no choice but to shift to. This is like an exercise in patience for you, Madison. It's like if she's going to apologize and then give a but, but that guy just cut me off. Like, I'm sorry for yelling, but that guy, like, right. you know, whatever that thing is, you may have to say, I'm sorry too. Yeah. I wish this was easier. Madison, can you lean on your sisters, though? And do they experience this? I know as the oldest child, you probably get the intensity. Yeah, they, like, we've talked about this topic, you know, plenty of times. And I have a lot of guilt about it as well, that, like, I took care of my sisters. And I now I've left. And now they're just there. And I have to deal with it. Are they still living with your mom? Yeah, so they still live with my mom. And then sometimes when I go home and then I just like hear the way she talks to them and then the way she talks to me, I'll just like not snap, but like all of a sudden I'm arguing again. I don't think I'm an argumentative person, but something happens when I walk into that house. I imagine you have a different relationship with your father. And I wonder if your mother is jealous. Yeah, I know she's jealous of it because I don't have the same resentment and anger, at least not in the way that she knows that I've held towards her. He got the help that he needed and he was always actively working on himself and he shared the things that he needed to share with me, but he didn't, you know, place like a huge burden on me by just telling me everything, like just like talking to me for hours about all these problems. You know, there was definitely, we had boundaries that was good for him and good for me. But with my mom, I was her support system. And that's a lot. Yeah. I think you should figure out sort of an ideal place that you want in terms of a relationship with your mom and kind of help guide her towards it. If it helps her, it may really help for you to say things like, shit, mom, that must have really hurt. Mm -hmm. She wants to be heard and her feelings to be validated because as much as you are now carrying as her adult self, she carried a lot of stuff, it sounds like. And perhaps she never was given the chance to dissect and digest all of that. And instead, she kind of added other things around her to try to like pad up what she just lost. 
And that's a lot. I mean, we all go through that some point in our life of feeling lost and then trying to fill in those holes. But you have such like a good sense of self and so grounded and so astute in how you think and you behave and the choice of words and you're so aware. And that is like light years beyond so many people out there for you to even recognize and to have this conversation, right? And to be able to accept all of it. You know, that's a lot. And you should be very proud of yourself for being that kind of person. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. I tried to make sensitivity my strength. I think it worked for me. Yeah, it's beautiful. And it is a difficult thing. And this whole idea, I think, requires generosity on your end. We can't tell you to say, mom, you can't get pissed off at me. Right. You just can't do that. Mm -hmm. She won't hear that. That'll be just like nothing to her. That's like, oh, Madison's being so sensitive again. I can't believe it. She called me and told me that. (laughs) Oh, what? I can't yell at her. I'm not. Never yell at her. Right. Madison, how does this sound? I feel like it's a lot of things that I've known almost. It just, it helps when someone else says it to you. (laughs) But you should never have to give your mother anything while taking away from yourself. And so that's when those boundaries really show up and define Mm -hmm. themselves, right? That's right. So you you will always come first. You always have to come first. And you give to her when you're ready to give to her. Madison, I really appreciate you writing to us. I really appreciate you taking the time to read my question and give me advice and and listen to me, you know. It it feels good just to talk it out and to have someone else hear my words. So thank you both. Bye, Madison. Thank you so very much. Bye, Anna. Bye, Kristen. Thank you. Bye. Oh my God, she's so sweet. I know. She was so adorable. You gave beautiful advice. Oh, <laughs> thanks. You know, what's interesting is that at a certain point, the biggest way you learn is being able to see yourself in other people and sometimes the not so glamorous side of other people, right? And I saw, I was like, crap, I was her mom, you know? Yeah. Like, but I was so sad. I was so sad. And the people around me just showed me patience and love. And that's all they had to do, you know? Yep. You have no choice but to work your way out of it if you want to continue being loved. You're totally right. You have to extend more Mm -hmm. than you get. Yeah. Kristen, do you have time for one more call? Let's do it. Thank you so very much. Yeah. Okay, so our next caller is Natalie. Hi, Natalie. Hi. Hey, how are you? I'm doing all right. (laughs) How are you guys? (laughs) We're great. This is Kristen. Talk chef. (laughs) Yeah. Natalie, will you tell us what's going on? Yeah, I've got kind of like a bit of an issue. Um, There's this girl I've been kind of hanging out with this past year. I've known her since sixth grade. Was super platonic the whole time. Never hung out with her, you know, during our school time. And she's also my best friend's husband's ex-girlfriend. And was like, I think each other's kind of like first everything. And so when I told her that I was like hanging out with her husband's ex-girlfriend, she was kind of like, you know, whatever is what it is. It was a long time ago. Didn't care. And uh, things were super platonic. Did not think that this girl had any interest in me because she's just like, guys are always going after her. And so she started hanging out with me a lot more. And we realized we had a lot of mutual interests. And we ended up discovering that we actually like lived down the street from each other. So that led to us hanging out even more. And little by little, I don't know, she'd start doing these things. And I'd be like, I don't know if she's just being nice or if she's kind of being flirty. And my first thing is always like, they're just being nice. I never assumed that anybody. Natalie, can you give us an example? Is that like a touch of the shoulder? Is that like... Yeah, she was being like touchy. She would say things like every time we would hang out, she'd be like, you know, how's dating life? And I'd be like, what dating life? (laughs) Non-existent. (laughs) And I'd ask her the same. And, you know, and because it was platonic at the time, she would talk to me about whatever situation she was dealing with with some guy. So something happened and some guy she was talking to like that fizzled out. And during Pride Month, you know, I had invited her to go to San Francisco. You know, everybody goes to Dolores Park. Invited her to that, but she couldn't make it. And I was like, well, you know, we're also going to hang out at the beach. Like, come along. 
And that day she was being especially kind of like very cuddly. Wait, so she didn't go to the parade, but she met you at the beach. Yeah. Alone? No, with some friends. Okay. Yeah, we were with some friends. And so that day, I remember she was just being very like hugging me and she's being like kind of flirty, but still, you know, I'm like oblivious as fuck. And it's just like, she's being nice. Dude, she seems like a tease. <laughs> I'm sorry. I want to hear more. <laughs> And so, um, <laughs> and so later we get back home and she's like, what are you about to do? And I was like, mm, nothing, you know, probably just going to hang out. She's like, you, you want to come over and watch RuPaul's Drag Race? <laughs> and I was like, yeah, sure. And so we were hanging out that night and then we were just like talking and talking. Mm. And so that night when I was like saying goodbye, you know, we got caught in this like weird limbo where I was like, yeah. And then finally <laughs> she kind of just like grabbed my face and kissed me. But it was a very quick kiss. And I was just like, okay, cool. I'll see, see you later. Did not say anything else about it. I was just like, super, like, I was like, what the fuck just happened? You just like driving <laughs> home and like, yeah, oh, <laughs> exactly. And so, of course, I told my best friend, I'm just like, guess what just happened? She just kissed me. And she's just like, I fucking knew it. I fucking knew it. This was going to happen. And so as, you know, later on in the summer, we went to a wedding together. I was photographing the wedding and she helped me photograph it. And during the wedding, she was like totally acting like my girlfriend and was like hugging me, kissing me, doing all the stuff. And our friends were even asking like, how'd you two meet? And the bride, who was my friend, was like, you better take care of her. Oh boy. <laughs> so you have like everybody all excited for you guys. <laughs> Yeah, unintentionally. When we're not even sure what the deal is. Yep. But everyone is like, yes. Yep. God, that's a lot of pressure. Yeah, if you didn't know us and you were there and you saw what was happening, anybody would assume that shit was happening. And so, you know, after like that night, things progressed. Like we <laughs> hooked up. But then like the days following, she got very quiet. And I know she was dealing with some stuff. So I was kind of giving her her space. And then it was just like weird that she was being super distant. And then some friends that were at the wedding with us, one of them came up to me and was just like, hey, are you and Jane? <laughs> All right. And I was just like, yeah, I think so. Why? What, what's up? And she's like, well, my boyfriend saw her downtown with some guy and she had her hand on his leg and then they were also like kissing. And I was like, oh, OK. So, of course, I was like crushed. And uh, I live in Napa. Napa is a small town. Despite how big it is, I hate going downtown because you always run into everybody. And everyone knows everyone. It's like a high school reunion down there. And uh, yeah, I have a love-hate relationship with that. It sucks. Yeah, I totally feel you. <laughs> is everyone kind of like involved then? Like they all want to sort of know? Yeah. So at this point, everybody's like, you know, under the impression that we're like a thing. But she and I hadn't even had a conversation about what was going on, like to set any kind of boundaries. You know, we weren't like on the same page. So if she was under the impression that it was just like a one time thing and nothing was going to happen after that, that feelings weren't going to be evolved. None of that was mentioned. And so I think that's where we fucked up. We never set kind of like these boundaries. Mm. And so when we would hang out after that, I never mentioned that I knew what I knew. Because I was kind of hoping that she would be honest with me. And so a lot of time went by and, you know, I knew when she was hanging out with these guys because, like, she would be very quiet. Like, she'd go from, like, texting me and all that stuff and, like, posting on social media to just completely going silent. And so it just, like, planted that thought in my head that, you know, she must be out with some other guy or whatever. And we had gone to a music festival out here and she went with me and... um while we were at the music festival, same thing, just completely making out with me. So she would refer to herself as my girlfriend, but only on her terms. Like I never referred to her as my girlfriend mm. to anybody else. And she would just be like, like, would she say something like my girlfriend wants a beer or yeah. Yep. Gotcha. That kind of thing. So to strangers, not to like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Gotcha. Okay. Just like that. And then, so I was just like, okay, but I knew that she was already seeing one specific guy while referring to me as this, and like still holding my hand and like kissing me and all this stuff. And it made me so sad because, you know, you want to believe when someone tells you that they like, they love you and they care about you. 
but then you know that this stuff's going on on the side and they're just like not telling you about it. And that's completely what it was. And the whole time that we were at this music festival, she was texting this guy while telling me she like loves me and, you know. Oh, man. And so I kept it cool. I was just like, I'm here. I'm just trying to have a good time. (laughs) And so I would brush it off, not mention that I knew anything once again. But the whole night, it kind of went on like that. And just the last couple weeks before the year ended, she um, actually took a trip to Idaho in the dead of winter. And I was like, are you going by yourself? Mm. And she was just like, yeah, I'm taking a solo trip. Like, you know, I've been stressed out with work and everything that's been going on. So I thought a little vacation would be nice. And I was like, okay, cool. Like, that should be fun. I love taking solo trips. But then I was like, I don't know. I just had this hunch. I was like, there's no way she's going by herself. She must be going with someone. And she hasn't confirmed it. And I don't have any solid proof, but I'm pretty sure she went with the dude that she was texting during the festival. Oh. I feel like I've left like so many windows of opportunity where she could have just like told me. But I feel like either she has like no self-awareness or if she felt like it was information that would hurt my feelings, she didn't want to say I have some thoughts, but I want to hear from Kristen. You know, here's the thing. And I had a similar relationship. Circumstances, very, very different, but very similar. And when I give you these examples, it's certainly me not saying I wasn't part of the problem. I certainly am, right? And Mm -hmm. I was. So we'll just set that straight. One, you have enough worth and you are worthy enough of being able to call her shit out, period. End game, end story, full stop, like... You know stuff, and she's not telling you. One time, fine. Two times, nah, it's over. You got to say something. Because ultimately, you're prolonging potential feelings that are going to hurt your heart. Secondly, clearly a conversation needs to be had in general to clear up, to figure out if you're going to stay together or if you want to call her out because she's dating these dudes and she's going to be like, you know what, you're right. It's just me and you now, like whatever. We don't know why she's going and still continuing on this life. Is it because she wants your attention? Does she want to be like, hey, look what I can do. Why aren't you coming after me? Kind of thing. She sounds like an actress. Right. (laughs) (laughs) Or or is it because she's just kind of a little bit of a player and non-committal at the moment? Both are valid. So you got to say something. You have to. Uh, I know. Your feelings are just as important as her feelings, period. Yeah. And you're allowed to say whatever you want to say. And I was in a similar position where I was holding on to this relationship that was not right. Because genuinely, when we were together, it was great. It was good. It was passionate. There was a lot of like love and connectivity between us. But there were these moments. And those are the moments that you're like, wait a second. Hold on. Even if it's once every three months, those moments are big, big, big news. And you have to talk about them. And so can I ask you why after the first time she didn't say anything, why perhaps you didn't broach that subject with her? After a while, I thought it was just like at that point, I still hadn't had like solid feelings for her. I was very much okay with it being like what it was, like if it was just casual thing and she was going to do her thing and I was going to do my thing. I was able to like move past it. But then as things progressed, like I found myself catching feelings. And at that point, she was still doing what she was doing with me. And I was just constantly confused and trying to figure out, like, did I do something wrong? Are you scared of asking the question in fear of what a response may be? Or you just maybe don't like confrontation? Well, yeah, we're both people that aren't very confrontational. And actually yesterday I was trying to have a conversation with her just because I actually mentioned that I was going to be talking to you. And oh, good. She said it was fine. But (laughs) I know, you know, it's not ever fine. (laughs) Fine is an awful word. (laughs) As soon as she said, I was like, oh, I'm fucked. (laughs) But the conversation I wanted to have with her yesterday ended up not happening because she was just like, you know, I think I need to just stay home. I want to be by myself right now and kind of process some things. So I was like, all right, I'll not have that conversation. What about her is seductive? Like what draws you to her? You know, when we started hanging out that we had a lot of mutual interests and it was just so easy to hang out with her and I have hung out around her and her family already. But this was like before it turned into anything. Like I met her family before any of this went down. It was easy to jump into conversation with her after not hanging out with her since like high school or middle school. 
We both like photography. And so for fun, I photograph concerts sometimes. And I had uh, an opportunity to photograph a band that we both like. And so I was like, bring your camera. You can get some practice in. And it's not like I do that with every <laughs> every girl. I'm just like, this is very much like a date thing. Yeah, Natalie, you do seem strong. <laughs> and you also seem really intuitive and a little bit guarded. Like it's hard to kind of get into your heart, which does draw a very specific type of person. Someone who is like, I like a little challenge. <laughs> yeah. Even though it's not exactly conscious. I'm sure she doesn't mean to. Yeah be selfish in this behavior. But am I wrong in that I don't know if Jane is at a place in life where she's going to, like, love you the way that you want? Mm -hmm. Natalie, I hear you on the girls that used to be married to men or dated men, and then they're like, okay, and then they jump on over. And then for you to sit in a place where this person, when you met her or know of her, she was married to a man. And now you guys had your thing. And now she keeps going back to men. If you bring it up and she's like, you know what? No, I'm all in with you. Let's do this. Is there any part of you that has lost a little bit of trust already that is not returnable? Yeah, it's like the foundation of it is like, how are you really going to fully want to be with someone if you can't trust them? It seems like you're kind of already going through the breakup a little bit. What do you want out of the whole thing? Like, what are you hoping for? I mean, if a relationship isn't going to come out of it, I would maybe hopefully want to be friends again at some point. I know it's not going to happen right away. You know, it's probably going to take some time on both ends to be able to hang out like we did before anything happened. And it kind of sucks because we already had like a bunch of stuff planned for like later on in a couple months, which is oh, even God. fucking worse. Jane. <laughs> we need to talk to Jane. Where's Jane? Yeah. <laughs> Can't make like romantic plans. Oh, gosh, I know. And it that was stupid on my end. No, no. <laughs> no, 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 it's not. Because here's the thing. When someone shows you love, we are conditioned to want more of that love. Like if it's coming from a person that you want it from, you are going to do anything and everything to receive it, to take it, to only see the good. Yeah, like this is every single one of us is like that. And okay, maybe this one time you had this conversation, she gets a little bit of a pass for, you know, I don't want to have this conversation right now. You have to respect that boundary 100%. However, before the next time you even have a conversation about anything else, before the next time you even hang out, even in a friend context, before you invite her to go on an awesome photography trip, even platonically, it's got to get settled, you know, and she's got to step up for you for sure. And you can't F with people's hearts. You just can't. You can't because it's too important and it's like too sacred of a machine that we own. And you definitely, and I will remind yourself because I had to do the same thing with me and I told myself all the time, Kristen, remind yourself, Natalie, remind yourself, you are worthy of the love that you give and you are worthy of the love that you deserve. And if this isn't it, even in pockets of love, then she's not it. And she's not there, no. you know? Yeah. She probably wasn't 100% there for the other guys either. If I had some friends that said the same. If one goes through life without like a vulnerable rejection, you just haven't lived. <sighs> yeah. Unfortunately. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> she sounds like someone, Jane, sounds like someone that perhaps will feed you one narrative and give you one version of the story. And then her actions are going to kind of like bounce around a little bit. And then she'll maybe like come back and touch you on your shoulder a little bit. And she'll do this and she'll do that. And she'll give you a little bit of a glimmer of a hope. Yeah. But you deserve all of it, not just a little bit of it. Yeah. So how much pain are you willing to put yourself through, Natalie? Oh, shit. Uh, I have to take a couple Zoloffs before I have a conversation. <laughs> well, listen, I understand that if we said, don't talk to Jane anymore, you got to let this one go. That's a hard request mm -hmm. that most people can't listen to very easily. I know that I couldn't. Like, I was chasing Brent Cotty for <laughs> years. <laughs> and he sure went off to Idaho. <laughs> so I understand, while I think that we can all agree, all three of us, that Jane is not showing you the love that you want and need and deserve that it's easy, you know, for us to be like, well, just, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. cut her out. I know that life doesn't necessarily work like that. What I do think you should do, Natalie, is gauge your own feelings. If your heart is hurting a lot 
And she gives you these like moments, these brief moments of highs when she like looks at you and, you know, kisses you or hugs you or talks about your mutual interests. I mean, right now, Natalie, you're kind of even smiling a little bit like, (laughs) shit, you're in it, Natalie. (laughs) You know, but it's also okay. This relationship that I was hanging on to that I knew was not right for me. We like broke up a gajillion times and my friends are like, don't do it. Don't do it again. And then I'm the asshole that's like, hey, and then she comes back. But that's normal. (laughs) It's normal and it's going to happen, maybe. And it's also okay. And at a certain point, you exhaust yourself of it. Sometimes it feels like that's the only less painful way of getting through it instead of just like so cut and dry, you know, but also know that if that happens, that's okay. Yeah. And at least you had like, The hard blows. Yeah. (laughs) And that may happen a few more times. And I want you to protect your heart. I want you to receive the kind of love that you can give and just kind of gauge that idea. Yeah. Yeah. I will say whatever happens from this scenario, whether you end up together, fantastic, great. If you don't and you cut it off super cleanly, fine. If you break up a gajillion times and retext a gajillion times and just like spiral in a tornado for a minute, also fine. Just keep your eyes out for other James. <laughs> I mean, that, that person. Yeah. <laughs> yes, where you have to kind of remain honorary to yourself too, where you're not looking, looking, but like you've also not closed yourself off to any other loving possibilities, whether it be platonic or romantic. Because there's so much more beyond, um, I guess, instead of scooting around the subject, I'll give you just a real life example. I was dating this person back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And then finally it was like, nope, we can't do this anymore. Enough is enough. When I did that, I started like seeing things a little bit differently. And as soon as I was accepting of, wow, God, that wasn't for me. Oh my God, what was I doing? You know who showed up? My wife. My wife showed up in every form that I was able to see and receive in that moment. And I'm like, God damn it. That's why I just went through all that shit, you know, because you're like, hold on a minute. And things really show themselves like that. And it's just, it's wild how life works. Shit. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. I don't know where to even leave off with it. (laughs) You just got to talk to Jane and wherever that conversation goes. Yeah. Yeah. Have the conversation. Yeah. You know, if you want, like you lay it on the table, you say, this is how I'm feeling about you. And I get the sense that I'm more into you than you are into me. And I want you to know this so I can kind of gauge how we're moving forward, if we are moving forward, if you feel like having that conversation, you know. But the good news (laughs) is that you've borne witness to how Jane could hurt your heart. And so your heart is like that little grain of sand in an oyster that slowly will heal itself and become this grand pearl as Jane becomes more and more distant in your past. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if she hears this podcast, maybe she'll be like, no, I love Natalie. (laughs) (laughs) And I went to Idaho to learn all about animal husbandry. (laughs) I could only hope. (laughs) They got it all wrong. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, Natalie... I know none of this is easy. You got it. I mean, you got it in whatever way you want to have it. Yeah. You've you've got it. Yeah. Truly. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely a conversation that needs to happen for sure. Yes. Yeah. I think it'll be productive for you and good for you, but I don't think you'll get too much information out of it. That's what I suspect. Yeah. Yeah. She's going to scoot around a little bit. Yeah. I'm sure she'll like squirm in her seat and try to, you know, avoid and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. But just know that wishy-washy BS Not worth it. Yeah. When someone's there for you, they're there for you the whole way. Yeah. Especially as being a romantic partner. Yeah. I think ultimately we're all truly better off after a heartbreak. I think it helps us develop a sense of empathy. I'm just sorry that you kind of might be in it, (laughs) Natalie. Oh, sorry. I know I feel way better when it passes, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And it will. It'll be slow, but it'll happen. Yeah. Yeah. You You got it. You got it. (laughs) Natalie, thank you so much. You're awesome. Yeah, you're fantastic. I appreciate it. Thank you, guys. I'm glad I did this. Good, good. (laughs) Because I'm really glad you did, too. I appreciate your guys' feedback, for sure. Thank you so much, Natalie. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks, you guys, too. Bye. Bye. 
Oh my God. That was like, I went through the exact same thing. I don't think you're human until you do. Yeah. Truly, Kristen, thank you so very much. It truly is an honor. I really, really admire you. And this was so lovely. Thank you. Likewise. Likewise. Have a good one. You too. I'll see you in Connecticut. (laughs) 